George Galloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Let's get ready to mumble, as Joe Biden would say, and it's live. Last week, 1,241,944 people watched all or part of the mother of all talk shows, a record. Nearly 400,000 on the YouTube platform alone. Truly extraordinary evidence of the market that is there for a different point of view, for a different perspective on the great issues of the day. And we will be covering them this evening. The slow motion attempted murder of the rightful Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, continues at Zaman Park in Islamabad. It is a real and present danger that in front of our eyes, the rightful leader, the choice of perhaps three quarters of the people of Pakistan will be killed in cold blood by the very same people that killed two of his predecessors before. I'll be going into that issue more concretely in the rest of my monologue. But we'll be talking about uh, Yusaka. They call the AUKUS because it's not quite as insulting to the British and the Australians, but it truly is Yusaka and their meeting in the Anglo-Saxon bubble as they described and discussed how they were going to make war on China. Rashid Sanuk, the British end of the Troika, has threatened war this week against both Russia and China, even though he's in ultimate command of a Royal Navy held together by super glue. I'm not making that up, whose aircraft carrier was towed out of Southampton and broke down again at the Isle of Wight within sight of the banks at Southampton. We'll be talking about the banks, the broken banks, and the banks yet to break. Perhaps Credit Suisse will be next. How will the Mafia possibly recover from such a sickening blow? And breaking news. The Dutch farmers in the first exit poll in the Dutch general election have beaten the Prime Minister of the Netherlands, Mark Rutte. Sing hallelujah. From zero to nine members of parliament, placing them one ahead of the governing party. And some of you fools say there is no God. Fasten your seatbelts. This is going to be a bumpy night because it is the mother of all talk shows. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway. The world is our classroom. And you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. It was revealed by serving sailors on board Britain's nuclear submarines that parts of the Trident submarine fleet are literally super glued together. Our aircraft carrier, which for a very long time had no aircraft upon it, has broken down all over the world. As I said, it broke down at the dock in Portsmouth, was towed out of the dock, started then broke down again in the Isle of Wight. Some people saw it break down both times. The entire British Armed Forces could comfortably fit into Villa Park in Birmingham, not a particularly gigantic football stadium. I mean the Navy, the Air Force and the Army, but notwithstanding that this diminutive popinjay, this 
little Napoleon with none of Napoleon's military prowess, no grand army, threatened both Russia and China in a single week. Even though he's the Prime Minister of a country that is virtually bankrupt, even though he's the Prime Minister of a country that cannot even defend its own food banks from the depredations of the county lines drug gangs, as somebody pointed out on Twitter just the other day. Even though he's the Prime Minister of a country where it's not safe to go out after dark in most of Britain's cities. Even though he's the Prime Minister of a country where people are running wild with machetes in high streets, in broad daylight. Even though he's the Prime Minister of a country, perhaps most notably at all, which cannot defend its own borders but is determined to defend the borders of Taiwan. Even though, according to the British government, and all but 13, now 12 governments in the entire world, Taiwan is part of China and therefore does not have any borders. But we are going to defend those non-existent borders. The mother of all talk shows next Wednesday will come from Beijing and will deep dive, if you'll forgive the pun, into all of those issues there. Why am I talking about these three Anglo-Saxon, puerile, pathetic apologies for leaders? Well, that's because they were all together in the Yusaka summit. And did you notice who was sitting in the front row for World War III? Yes, that's right. Victoria's Secret. Victoria Newland, who turns up like Zelig or perhaps like Satan himself on the scene of every single zone of conflict in which the United States is involved. Under the careful, steely gaze of who ate all the pies, Victoria Newland, these three, two of whom couldn't find the door if they didn't have aids to usher them out of it, and the other, if he stood up, you wouldn't be able to tell. They were there to announce their confrontation with China. They had traveled thousands of miles to China's region of the world to complain about China's aggression. They are getting ready to sail nuclear-powered submarines in Chinese waters around the area of Taiwan. They say that they will not be nuclear armed, but if you believe that, you'll believe anything. You probably believed Tony Blair and Alistair Campbell when they told you that Iraq was just bristling with weapons of mass destruction. I'll come back to Mr. Campbell in just a minute. These people threatening to confront China are already at war with Russia even though their economies are sinking and their infrastructure is crumbling, even though you cannot drink clean water in Flint, Michigan or from the River Ohio, even though you can't safely get on a train in the United States of America. You certainly can't safely go over a bridge in the United States of America. They are devoting hundreds of billions of dollars, pounds and euros to confront China and Russia. As I say, next week we'll be in Beijing and we'll be deep diving into that subject. So let me turn to the other topics I want to talk about tonight. I have watched the slow motion murder of not one but two leaders of Pakistan. Back in the 1970s, as a young activist, I piloted through the city council of my hometown of Dundee a resolution demanding the saving of the life of Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, the legitimate leader of Pakistan, who was placed on trial by General Zia ul Haq and hanged by him, despite pleas for clemency from His Holiness the Pope, from the then King of Saudi Arabia, 
from civilized opinion throughout the Muslim world and indeed more widely. I loved Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. He was, in my view, the greatest of all Pakistani leaders. He was a great world leader, a great leader of the non-aligned movement. In the 1970s, as a young activist, it broke my heart to read of how his daughter, Benazir Bhutto, still attending him as he was about to go to the gallows, giving him a last cigar to smoke, smelling the Shalimar eau de cologne of his cheek as she kissed him for the last time. And then, after herself being in prison, I received Benazir Bhutto at the airport in London, stick thin, stick thin, blood still coming from her ears, from injuries sustained in the jail. And I stood by her side for three decades. And I watched her twice being overthrown by the very people now overthrowing Imran Khan and now threatening to put him to death. I spoke to Benazir Bhutto. May God preserve her and keep her memory alive forever on the eve of her departure from Dubai, on her ill-fated journey back to Pakistan. I watched her slow motion truck ride on top of a plinth, on top of an open top bus, an open top truck. I watched the millions in Pakistan come out to throw flowers at her and I knew, I knew, I knew that very soon it would not be flowers that they were throwing at her. And now I'm watching the slow motion attempted murder of a third popular leader of Pakistan. Outside Imran Khan's house right now, this instant, there are tens of thousands of protesters seeking to protect him from an ever more ferocious assault. First gas, now guns, firing live ammunition outside the house of the legitimate prime minister of the country. They say they want to take him to prison to face up to 80 charges, up to and including the allegation of murder. I've been in this play before. I've seen this playbook before. If Imran Khan is taken from Zaman Park and placed behind bars, you will never see his face again. Because if you think about it, how could they allow you to? A man so popular that they cannot possibly face him in a parliamentary election. Not just because he would beat them, but because he would so sweep the boards. He could put every single one of them on trial for sedition. He could change the constitution of a ramshackle republic that bitterly, deeply, profoundly needs changing. They cannot allow Imran Khan to live. And so if he is snatched by those body snatchers outside his home right now, as sure as eggs is eggs, he will be murdered because the usurpers can do nothing else. In Shakespeare's words, they are steeped in blood so far. Is it bloodier to go on or to go out? And so I say to his former brother-in-law, Lord Goldsmith, in the British Foreign Office, I say to his former friend, Boris Johnson, the erstwhile Prime Minister of Britain, I say to the Chancellor of Oxford University, whose distinguished alumni he is, I say to the entire foreign policy establishment in London and in Washington, 
You better save the life of Imran Khan, not just because this noble and brave man deserves to be saved, but because Pakistan will become completely uncontrollable if Imran Khan is murdered by the crime gang, the crime bosses that you have placed in power in his stead. 300 millions of the Pakistanis and 10 scores of millions of Pakistanis around the world will be uncontrollable if their leader is murdered. And Pakistan's in a very strategic place. If you need me to remind you, it borders with Iran, it borders with China, it borders with Afghanistan, it borders with India. Do I need to remind you that 300 million uncontrollable people live in a country that has an entire flight of nuclear weapons. If you do not want Pakistan to disappear into an unfathomable vortex of violence, you'd better tell your puppet regime in Islamabad to take their hands off Imran Khan, for if they harm one hair on the head of Imran Khan, they, not the usurpers, not the puppets, but the puppet masters, not the monkeys, but the organ grinders, will be responsible for what happens next. Now, on Sunday, I'll go into more depth about the 20th anniversary of the invasion and occupation of Iraq. Because, of course, I'm in a good position, a good vantage point, to talk to you about how all that went. I was one of the top leaders of the great movement against the war in Britain. I marched at the front of the great demonstrations of millions of people in Britain to try and stop the war, though the Stop the War organization has now airbrushed me from their history. Everyone who was around at the time, including Andrew Murray, the now president, who frequently stated that along with the late Mr. Ben, I was the most popular of all the speakers of all those demonstrations. You won't hear him or them say that now, but they cannot airbrush me from the history of that great movement against the war. Incidentally, Imran Khan spoke with me in Hyde Park on such a platform. I have only time to say one thing, and it is a significant thing. I saw today the laughing hyena, the jackal, Alastair Campbell, the Goebbels to Tony Blair, who lied us into the invasion and through the occupation of Iraq. I saw him laughing again in the launch of a podcast on the Iraq war. The man who lied us into the Iraq war is now making hay in a podcast, I may say, jointly produced with Gary Lineker. The two of them work closely together on a podcast which inexplicably appears to have a very large number of followers which just goes to show that crime does pay because Alistair Campbell and Tony Blair have become as rich as Cretius out of the great war crime. Now it has become de rigueur to describe the invasion and occupation of Iraq as a blunder. Although Campbell won't even do that, I saw that David Frum 
with whom I used to regularly tango in the media 20 years ago, said, and I quote, that the invasion of Iraq was a blunder is becoming more clear with every passing anniversary, with every passing year, that the invasion of Iraq was a blunder is more clear, says Mr. Frum. I told him that at the time. I warned him that at the time. But David Frum is prospering too, like Mr. Blair and like Mr. Campbell. And one of the lessons that we need to learn and haven't learned because the same people that talked you into the war in Iraq are trying to talk you into a war with China, with Russia, with Iran, with anybody that the emperor stumbles upon as they spin the bottle to see who will be next. My first guest this evening is from one of the places at which the bottle might rest. He's Professor Syed Mohammed Morandi, and he's coming up right now. Stay tuned. The 1897 edition of War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells, read by George Galloway, available only on Patreon. The cylinder was artificial, hollow, with an end that screwed out. Something within the cylinder was unscrewing the top. Good heavens! said Ogilvy. There's a man in it, men in it, half roasted to death, trying to escape. At once, with a quick mental leap, he linked the thing with the flash on Mars. The thought of the confined creature was so dreadful to him that he forgot the heat and went forward to the cylinder to help turn. But luckily, the dull radiation arrested him before he could burn his hands on the still glowing metal. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. You can hear my rendition of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds on my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash George Galloway. Now, if you want to call up about anything I've said or didn't say, here are the numbers in the UK and Ireland. Remember, it's absolutely free of charge. It's 0808196552. That's 0808196552. In the US and Canada, it is equally toll free. It is plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. That's plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. And if you're in the rest of the world, it's plus four four two zero three nine double six two six two five. We've got a poll running and 15,000 people have already voted in it and the show has just begun. Is Donald Trump the only man who can halt the slide into World War III? He says so. What do you think? A, yes, B, no. You can vote on my Twitter feed, on my YouTube channel. Please do subscribe to it on my Telegram channel, t.me forward slash George Galloway, where a record number of people have already voted, and on the YouTube community poll, where 12,000 people have already voted. Is President Donald Trump the only man who can halt the slide to World War III? A, yes, B, no. Now, Professor Saeed Mohammed Marandi, one of the most learned and the most popular of our guests, 
doesn't get many opportunities on the television, except here on the mother of all talk shows. And that's because he is an eloquent and erudite spokesman who is broadcasting from Tehran. He's the professor of English literature and Orientalism at the University of Tehran. Professor, welcome back to uh, the mother of all talk shows. Let me start in your own region, though I would like your uh, views on uh, other parts of the world too. The tectonic plates shifted in Beijing uh, when uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia metaphorically kissed and made up. That's pregnant with all kinds of uh, good things, isn't it? Not only is it good for Saudi Arabia and Iran, it's good for the neighborhood. It's good for the prospects of resolving long-running conflicts in the neighborhood. How did it all come about? I'm sure you recall that a little over three years ago, uh, the Iraqi Prime Minister, after the United States under Trump murdered General Soleimani, uh, the Iraqi Prime Minister said that uh, General Soleimani was actually going to Baghdad to meet him. Uh, he was supposed to meet the Prime Minister early in the morning at 8 a.m. to discuss a letter from Saudi Arabia, uh, which was sent to discuss decreasing tensions. So General Soleimani was basically in Baghdad to de-escalate or find a way to de-escalate between Iran and Saudi Arabia with the help of the then Iraqi Prime Minister Adel Abdul Mahdi. After Trump murdered him, there was a a while, it took a while before the Iraqi government again attempted to mediate between the two sides. Again, Iran, ex Iran and Saudi Arabia both accepted. And there were a number of rounds of negotiations that mostly took place in Iraq. Uh, there was progress, but it didn't lead to a deal. Later on, the Chinese president, President Xi, when he traveled to Saudi Arabia, uh, in his meetings with Saudi leaders, it was discussed, or the issue of mediation was discussed between them. And uh, after he returned to China and before uh, President Raisi's trip to Beijing, a message was sent to Iran about the idea of mediation, what the Saudis and the Chinese discussed. When President Raisi went on his state visit to Beijing during the negotiations, he agreed to uh, have the Chinese mediate. And uh, the rest, we all know, last week, the two sides were able to come to an agreement and reestablish ties with one another. So I think that was a major plus uh, for China because it showed Chinese behavior to be very different from that of the United States, while the Chinese are trying to decrease tensions and to uh, decrease hostility. The Americans have, in the eyes of most people, I would assume, in our region, uh, they have been after division and after exploiting divisions and increasing uh, potential rifts between the different countries. And uh, I think by the Chinese have actually, uh, by behaving almost the exact opposite of that of the United States, they've made the Americans look even worse. And of course, uh, because of this rapprochement, I think there is a good opportunity that there will be more movement uh, with regards to Syria. The Saudis in the past, as you know, were supporting ISIS and Al Qaeda in Syria, as well as in Iraq along with a host of other countries, NATO countries and non-NATO countries. Now, hopefully, there is talk, or the Saudis have said that they wish to uh, change the relationship between uh, Saudi Arabia and Syria. So that's good news. They have been making some positive noise on Lebanon. And hopefully, the Saudis will uh, find 
the um, will to bring about peace in Yemen as well. So I think that this could be a first step to decrease tensions across the region, which of course will make both Americans very un both Americans and the Israeli regime very unhappy. Well, I was going to turn to Israel. Uh, we'll come back to the United States if we have time. But uh, Israel, of course, publicly uh, expressed its uh, anger at this deal uh, in Beijing. Uh, and lo and behold, uh, there are reports this evening uh, about an alleged IED attack by Hezbollah in the northern part uh, of Israel uh, and the um, briefing to the media that Israel may very well launch an attack on Lebanon uh, to, uh, as it were, avenge it. Uh, this can be directly related, can't it, to the uh, breakthrough in Saudi Iranian uh, relations. Yes, the Israeli regime is looking for a means to distract public opinion away from problems at home. On the one hand, the divisions in Israeli society are clear for everyone to see. People have seen the protests, the Israel is a very right-wing society, but the current uh, regime led by Netanyahu is extremely right-wing, uh, so right-wing that even the Europeans and especially the Americans are criticizing it, something that we don't often see. And uh, the attacks on Syria, for example, that we've seen over the past uh, couple of weeks since the earthquake, uh, they were carried out to distract attention from the problems at home. And I think that what the Israeli regime right now is contemplating with regards to Lebanon is probably the same, because if they carry out an attack on Lebanon, then they will definitely uh, bring about war. Hezbollah will not stand indifferent. And the Israelis have already lost the war to Hezbollah uh, less than two decades ago. But I think Netanyahu really is so desperate uh, to remain in power and to distract public opinion away from the problems that he has at home, even though I think he has uh, the majority, I, he has a, a support base that could keep him in power, but I think he, he needs to distract attention away from this and he's willing to do anything. He has, I mean, to say that uh, a Zionist has principles is a bit, problematic, but in his case, he has no principles whatsoever. Uh, you got to hand it to them for chutzpah, though. Uh, Joseph Borrell, uh, the foreign minister of the European Union, has today been refused entry to Israel. Israel is a country that only exists on the largesse and the political and diplomatic indulgence of uh, the European Union and the United States. Heaven knows we even let them play in the European football tournaments, though they're not European. Well, they are European, but they're not in yeah. Europe. Uh, we, we even let them into the Eurovision Song Contest. And yet they can slam the door in the face of the foreign minister of the European Union. You've got to hand it to them. Uh, they know how far they can push those who pay them, don't they? Yes, and they can push very far. And Netanyahu, once upon a time, said something uh, similar about the United States. He he always felt that he knew how, how to handle the United States, and he believed that he can get away with literally anything. And the same is true in Europe. Uh, the irony, of course, is that the, uh, the head of the European Union foreign policy apparatus uh, himself is 
quite a racist when he spoke about uh, the European Union being a garden and literally almost all of the rest of the world being a jungle. Uh, many people were quite stunned, but he never really withdrew the mark, remark. He, he, tried to, to, he tried to explain it, but it was obvious what he was talking about. And that is very similar to the attitude of the Israelis. They, they too see the Palestinians uh, and the Palestinian people as part of the jungle just like the Americans who see themselves as a shining city on a hill, an exceptional country. A country. Uh, they, all of them share the same mentality when it comes to viewing the rest of the world. So even though Joseph Borrell and the Israelis have a great deal in common, but it is ironic that the Israelis who need the Europeans behave that way to the Europeans, and we all know that nothing will happen. There will be no punishment. There will be no meaningful condemnation. The Israelis will just continue to move on, get their support, crush the Palestinian people, and uh, the story will move on to something else. Now, I want to take you uh, just for a few minutes, if I may, Professor, uh, to, uh, to, to a different part of the garden. Uh, Australia is, of course, not in Europe, though it is ruled by Europeans, uh, just like Israel, just like the United States. So I guess by extension, uh, they are uh, fellow denizens of the garden. And there this week sat uh, the three leaders of USACA, uh, or, or AUKUS, as they more politely call it, Australia, United Kingdom, and USA. Uh, the, the, the optics were dazzling for me, especially when I spotted Victoria Newland in the front row. She'll definitely want a front row seat for World War III. But I wondered if they knew just what a tiny bubble they looked like. They looked like three men in a bubble, uh, talking as if they represented the world, whilst in fact representing an ever-shrinking part of the world. This Anglo-Saxon bubble, although Rashid Sanuk uh, is only an honorary Anglo-Saxon, if you get my meaning. How did it look to you? It, it looked the same. And the uh, United States is the, the side that wins in this uh, agreement. The, the, the Australians are the ones who are going to suffer the consequences. The, just like the Europeans who are being sacrificed by the Americans, the Australians are being sacrificed by the Americans too. They're going to be forcing them to pay an enormous amount of money uh, which will be enormously beneficial for the U.S. military. And on the other hand, they're going to only create hostility uh, and uh, anger in Beijing. And we're also seeing other countries in Southeast Asia beginning to react uh, to this agreement because it is... Contrary to what the Americans and the Europeans like to say, the European leaders and American leaders, the Global South is, is not sympathetic to the United States. It's not sympathetic to Australia. And it's not sympathetic to uh, any part of NATO and its operations. Regardless of the fact uh, that the war in Ukraine is, in my view, and in the view of many, uh, mostly uh, a problem that the, that NATO has created. But re regardless of all that, one reason why people are not sympathetic to the Ukrainian government is because they've seen so much suffering caused by Western powers across the world, across Africa, across the Americas, across uh, Latin America, across Asia, 
very few people, very few countries have gone unscathed, if any, uh, because of their interaction with Western powers in the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. So people find, let's say, they, they just have a tendency, they just, uh, they have a, they, they, regardless of the nature of the conflict, they just like to see the U.S. lose. And uh, what Australia is doing is that by becoming a part of this foolish alliance, a, a country which has, I think, a population of uh, a bit less than 26 million, they are putting their own citizens at risk. They are antagonizing the people across the region that have a dark history with the United States. And uh, they are antagonizing the country, meaning China, that is the source of a great deal of the wealth of the people of Australia. Indeed, it's the biggest trading partner. And maybe some of them have forgotten how the current Australia uh, came into being in the first place, having been conquered by settlers and the actual Australians being systematically, genocidally wiped out. And then we sent some criminals there. I suppose that's what we did with the USACA meeting again. Thank you, Professor Morandi, for joining us on the mother of all talk shows. Is President Donald Trump the only man who can halt the slide to World War Three on Twitter? A, yes, 65%. No, 35%. On YouTube, yes, 55%. No, 45%. On Telegram, yes, 56%. No, 44%. And on YouTube, community poll, yes, 57%, no, 43%. 16,427 votes have been cast and relatively, relatively narrow result. Make sure you get your point of view registered by voting before the end of the show. Let me take a quick break. I'll be right back, I promise. Back to the lines. There's Big Tommy in Glasgow. On you go, Tommy. Ding dong, the witch is dead. <laughs> We've spoke before when one of the witches died. If you remember, Maggie Thatcher, brother, you remember? I felt the same about Sturgeon going as I did about Thatcher going. Me too, Absolutely brother. Me too, me too. Exactly the same feeling of elation. So having had to live with her in this country, and as it got worse and worse, yeah. I, I was despotic. I was just. It's disgraceful that we could have a leader like that dictating to us in Scotland. Disgraceful that the Scottish people exactly. were being fooled. Whatever, whatever Boris said, she added 20%, misery added tax, uh, and, and had a press conference that lasted all day announcing 20% worse restrictions than well, Boris had exactly. imposed. Well, and I was, I was, I was crazy. I was all for Boris. I disliked Boris. But I'm sitting there going, oh my God, how have we got a leader 20% like you say, worse than Boris? It was unbelievable. Tommy, we're a miserable people to begin with. If you add 20% misery added tax to us, no wonder this last couple of years in Scotland has been absolute miserable hell. Exactly, George. And you know, right, at the start when they mooted this independent stuff, I was against it for the reason this is a sideshow. This is going to disrupt the people and take people's eye for the real game from how bad the country is. And I've seen what these people are like, these independent, shortbread heads. This little guy, oh, anyway. So when I've seen what it was all about, I understood it clearly. This is not right. And when you've seen the policies that were enacted on, they're building two ships, or trying to build two ships, they cost more than the parliament. She's trying to cut the toddlers off of 16-year-old boys. I mean, she's fell on her sword. Thank God that all the 16-year-old boys who are thinking about changing their thing will be breathing a bit safer tonight in their beds. Tommy, Tommy, I love you, man. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway.
Go on yourself, Tommy. Uh, here's the phone numbers. UK and Ireland, 0808196552. US and Canada, plus 1844944334. Rest of the world, 4420396262. Uh, the best of the YouTube comments is from Andrew Gora. To compare Victoria Newland to Satan is an insult to that gentleman's character. <laughs> Proles Rolls says the UK government has just given the brainwashing boring crap BBC £20 million to counter misinformation. They also gave it £10 million towards the Eurovulsion Song Contest. I gave myself £159 in a cancelled license fee. To viewers overseas, let me quickly explain the rather quaintly British habit that not only do we have a dictatorial state broadcaster, we are forced to pay for it on pain of being sent to prison if we don't. Even Stalin didn't think of that one. Nobody important says <laughs> F-U-K-A-U-S. I'm not going to read that out. That's why they left France out, GG. No, they left France out because the USA stabbed France in the back, took the submarine deal off France and gave it to Britain and the United States. Now, I told you at the beginning... The Farmers Party went into today's elections in the Netherlands with zero members of parliament. Ha! Now they're ahead of the Prime Minister's party. Mark Rutte, he's the Netherlands' Tony Blair. I really can't describe him any more accurately than that. But I was in the Netherlands as the farmers set out for Brussels on another of their epic demonstrations. Gayatri did a very short video of me out in the snow just after they had left. Take a quick look. I'm in the Netherlands. There are no farmers and all the flags are turned upside down. For the moment, that's because the farmers are all in Brussels in a magnificent protest with all their farm equipment and machinery tractors and trailers. What a magnificent sight it was at daybreak to see them heading off. The Dutch flag is turned upside down everywhere in the countryside. Those that live in the liberal, so-called progressive city bubbles are confused about all this, but we are not. No farms, no food. And the idea that you should close down farmland because of some supposed green nostrums is simply absurd. Humans have been farming since almost the beginning of time. It is obvious that if you're not growing your own food, you're going to have to buy other people's food, unless you want to eat insects, and maybe that is the plan. I, for one, will never eat insects, and I'm with the Dutch farmers. No farms, no food. May God strengthen the Dutch farmers and may victory be theirs. Well, it looks like God did strengthen the Dutch farmers. They're romping ahead of the Prime Minister himself in the exit polls in the Dutch general election, which took place today, in which I shall take a very close interest and report back to you on Sunday. Let's uh, go to the lines. Jahangir is in Hounslow in London on Afghanistan. Let's hear from him. Jahangir, welcome. Thank you. Hello, George. I have great admiration for Hi. you, sir. Just wanted to say uh, that the Afghan currency has gained around 30% in value against the American dollar and the British pound in the last 18 months. And this is unprecedented Hallelujah. because... <laughs> yes, exactly. Because Afghanistan is. I knew the I most should have gotten into the Afghan currency market. 
<laughs> exactly. And this is this is unprecedented because Afghanistan is the most sanctioned country in the world, and in fact, no single country in the world recognizes them um, officially. So, I um, just wanted your thoughts about that because everyone is talking. Well, uh, about how it seems. Uh, it seems. Yeah, it, it seems to be. Um, I don't know what the word uh, is, it seems to be an automatic consequence of being sanctioned by the declining empire that your economy and your currency goes up instead of down. And the countries of the declining empire who impose the sanctions are the ones whose economy sinks and whose currency sinks. Uh, there must be justice in, in those scales, Jahangir. Exactly, because uh, and, and the most important thing is, I think, the, the, when when the Allied forces were in Afghanistan, there was um, corruption was its uh, highest, um, and and partly sure. it's maybe because of the corruption as well, because of um, you know the, the, the cor simple as that corruption, I think, because Afghanistan has no factories, no no economy. So nothing else explains that except to say that there is no corruption and the, the little money that comes out of the exports and import taxes um, that is um, uh, being used in the right way, in the right manner. So, uh, yeah, that's the, I just wanted your thoughts about that because uh, to me, well, everyone uh, is talking uh, about uh, Garland Nixon not, was uh, Yes, I'm not an expert on Afghanistan uh, and I'm not a fan of the Taliban, uh, but uh, it would have to be said, as the United Nations did before the overthrow of the Taliban 20 years ago, uh, that they were, the, uh, the, the, they were in first place in the world in the ruthlessness with which they were putting down the heroin trade. Uh, and when the American and British forces occupied the heroin-growing areas of Afghanistan, uh, Afghanistan quickly again became the world's biggest export of uh, heroin. So whatever else you would say about the Taliban, they were ruthless in rooting out uh, heroin trading. And from what you say, uh, appear at least honest in the accounting of uh, what little tax and excise duties they are able to uh, obtain. Of course, the United States has stolen hundreds of millions of dollars worth of Afghanistan's sovereign wealth, frozen it uh, in uh, United States banks. And of course, the former rulers of the 20-year occupation particularly the last one, uh, are, well, how shall I put it, doing rather well, Jahangir, and the ill-gotten gains of that governing caste, that comprador of the occupation force, well, let's just say they're all multi-millionaires, which is difficult to become in a poor country like Afghanistan. Thanks for the call. William is in New York on the issue of false flags. William, what do you want to say? Uh, well, George, first off, I hope everybody at Team Galway is doing well today. All good. Thank you very much, by the grace of God. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and I mean, whether it's, uh, you know, what occurred with the, uh, the American Predator drone, uh, but again, as rotten as the United States is, these games are played by empires all over the world. So I guess it's just, sure. you know, gradations of evil. Uh, and, you know, in our no, capital uh, society... Uh, look, uh, the U.S. doesn't do these things because they're American. They do them because they're an empire. Uh, we did them when we were an empire. Uh, all empires behave this way and all empires end this way. I was remembering uh, the woman, I won't say her name, who uh, tortured the Iraqi prisoners in Abu Ghraib, tortured them, sexually tortured them. An American woman, soldier, 
who sexually tortured the Iraqi prisoners and filmed herself doing so for the entertainment of the others in the barracks in the evening. And I f felt a, a, a mounting anger in my breast as I watched it all over again, and then I had to remind myself she did not do these things because she was an American. She did them because she was an occupier with absolute power over the helpless people, manacled in her presence. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. And she showed, Abu Ghraib showed, Bagram Airport showed, the Guantanamo Bay showed the degradation of the late empire society in which, unfortunately, William, you and I both live. Last word to you, William. Well, uh, well, George, I just want to tell everybody, you know, don't become possessed by your possessions. Uh, fear of losing possessions, that's the reason we buy insurance. Fear of not having what we want. So we see that this thing that enslaves us with these things that use us as walking billboards to show our worth, it's insanity. We have to talk to each other and re-engage. Very we well have put. We're, we're, George, you have a great evening. Well, yeah, uh, the, only riches, the only riches that matter to me are my family. And uh, I hope to walk with them in eternity forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, William, in New York. Now, you're being very generous on the Super Chat. Steve McNally gives 20 Australian dollars. Antiochus Australian here, GG. There are many of us who know where this leads and... Quite frankly, it's getting beyond terrifying. Unfortunately, the majority of my countrymen are beyond blinded. Bless you, mate. Good health. And to you, my dear Steve, please don't take personally anything I've said about the good people of Australia fair. It's your government and your media that is misleading the people who have earned my uh, contempt. Rick Mack sends 10 British pounds, and John Carroll, £1.99, and says, Catherine's listening. Goose Creek, a very good friend of the show, sends 11 euros from the Netherlands, in fact, and Roar Axdal sends 25 Norwegian krona. Sausage Supper, what a great, great name, sends £2.20. You sucker can bite my sausage. And Mahmoud Marhadi sends one US dollar. Don't be embarrassed about sending one of anything. One dollar, one euro, one pound from each of you would have Moats America on the air before you could say Jackie Robinson. Eric Chung sends five British pounds. Thank you, Eric. Darren Henry sends eight New Zealand dollars 99. Moats will one day lift the standard of journalism for all because it is one of the few news sources that can be relied upon to hear the truth. Thank you, Darren. Put that in a bottle and sail it round the world, please. Brian Hanley sends two pounds. Thanks, Brian. Stephen Mountain, two pounds. And JJ Gill, two pounds. Human Affiliated Media. Many thanks. Back to the lines. Nick is in Los Angeles. Let's hear from him. Go ahead, Nick. Hey, good, good evening, George, and thanks for taking my call. Uh, just a couple of things have come across, you know, the radar in the last few weeks. I think I think people like yourself and other other pundits who are trying to rattle the cage of the establishment are slowly getting some traction. And two things happened recently: one here in Los Angeles and one in Greece. Uh, first off. Um, our friend, uh, uh, comedian uh, Russell Brand, who was on a television show here that you've been on a few times, I think, the Bill Maher show. He seemed to upset a few people when he challenged the corporate media when they had a guest on with him who was from MSNBC. And the interesting thing was that uh, a rep quite a bit because he does some very interesting articles. George Mombiot seemed to attack him recently, which was very strange. And that, so I, I didn't quite understand where that was coming. Secondly, 
the attack uh, last week in Greece on uh, Yanis Varoufakis, where he was physically uh, uh, beaten up to the point where they, they broke his nose in six places. Uh, yet I saw him on a, a Greek television interview this morning or a recording of it, but uh, there was this physical assault that happened to him that was pretty alarming. So I just, I just wondered uh, your thoughts on that and if you'd heard this news. I hadn't heard that news, Nick, and I'm very disturbed to hear it. I have many political differences with Yanis Varoufakis, but political violence of any kind I abhor. I'm wearing a hat this evening precisely because of political violence visited upon me, about which virtually no one uh, gave a toss uh, in the political class or in the, in the mainstream media. Uh, but the assault that you describe sounds absolutely horrific. And if you were surprised at George Monbiot's vile assault on Russell Bland, it was, uh, uh, of course, not a physical assault, but it was as wounding as a verbal assault can possibly be, uh, then you've been out the country too long because the degeneration, uh, of the degradation of George Monbiot has been going on almost 20 years and has reached the pits. I'm not sure he can go any lower. But Russell Brand, uh, whom I vaguely know, I know his father better, uh, has, uh, has hit the jackpot, has hit the bullseye, so many times on so many issues, it can't be much longer before they ban him from the airwaves of the mainstream media as they have effectively banned me. But here's the good news. Russell Brand's audience on his own platform is vastly greater than the audience of the mainstream media that will shortly ban him. That's how the tables have turned. I'm banned from the mainstream media. Ask yourself, when was the last time you saw me on the BBC uh, or on Sky News or on CNN, on all of which I used to regularly appear? And the answer is a decade or so. And you will never see me on them again. Uh, but the good news is, as I announced at the beginning of the show, our audience for this show is vastly greater than the audience of the news and current affairs programs on that mainstream media that has banished me. So I'm banishing them. I don't want to know them and fewer and fewer people in your country and in mine give a toss about what they say or do. Many thanks, Nick, for that. I've missed my hourly mark, so let me take a break now, but to, I suppose, prepare you for the depth charge that is any interview with the one and only Bryce Green. It's coming up right after this. I get a lot of abuse from people in America that don't listen properly. They imagine that because I am viscerally hostile to Joe Biden and the so-called Democrats, that that means I'm a supporter of the Republicans and of Donald J. Trump. Neither of those is true. I'm not with either of these two big parties, two cheeks of the same backside. Even if we could agree which was the lesser attractive cheek, I still wouldn't be prepared to choose between them. I'm one of those that calls on, let me do so again here now, my good friend Jimmy Dore to run as a third party candidate for the People's party of America for a third force to emerge. That's what I want to see in America. And I'm 
more than happy to give whatever advice and experience that I myself have to any people of goodwill who want to build that third force. As I've said before, if my good friend Dr. Jill Stein were to be the Green Party nominee again, I would, of course, support her for President of the United States. If Tulsi Gabbard would run as an independent presidential candidate, I would support her. I would not be happy to see Donald Trump back in the White House, but I'd be very, very happy if Joe Biden wasn't. I'd be very, very happy if Kamala Harris wasn't, even if that meant that Donald Trump would have another term as president of the United States. You see my point? I regard the US Democrats as the greatest threat to peace on the planet. I believe that the world is much more dangerous with Biden and Harris and the Democrats in power. And therefore, I'd be happier if anybody could replace them as president of the United States. Doesn't mean I've become a Republican, at least not a US Republican. It doesn't mean I've become Trumpist or a devotee of the great orange Hulk. I'm not either of those things. But I've got to tell you, I think Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are a clear and present danger to the American Republic. And even more importantly, from my point of view, they're a clear and present danger to the peace of the world. Avoid World War III. Get rid of Joe Biden. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. He's a dreadnought in human form. He's a guided missile against the missile factories and the military industrial complex. He's the independent writer and analyst and very popular guest on the mother of all talk shows, Bryce Green. Bryce, welcome back. I want to ask you first about something that's just been brought to my attention. Um, somebody called Ned Price who is the State Department's spokesman, who said this today, and I'm watching his lips move as he says it, no country on earth has done more to build a more stable, more integrated Middle East than the United States of America. That may be the most preposterous statement ever made in the history of US governance. Discuss. Now, there have been a lot of preposterous statements made by the U.S. government, but yeah, like you say, this one takes the cake. I mean, the U.S. interference in the Middle East, I mean, they they took their mantle from the British at the end of World War II, and since then you've seen the uh, deposing of democratic governments like the one in Iran in the 50s, and you've seen uh, interventions like the funding of uh, radical terrorists, uh, radical jihadis in the 80s to draw Russia into the quote-unquote Afghan trap. Uh, and then you saw the U.S. starving of Iraq during the 90s. Then you see the brutal invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq in the 2000s. I mean, and then you go for, to Syria and to Libya. I mean, the list goes on. This is just an objectively absurd thing to say. But it's something that the empire has to believe when a country like China is actively making peace taking the real steps required to see peace and stability in that region. Uh, if uh, American imperial planners are uh, serious about the truth, well, I mean, they would have to take a serious look at their own actions, and then they'd have to conclude that, well, there's something wrong here. Uh, but uh, I believe it was uh, Upton St. Clair who said, it's difficult to convince somebody of something when their paycheck depends on them not understanding it. <laughs> Very good. I like that one. Uh, now, you made uh, a number of uh, brilliant points there. Let me go through them, uh, if I may. This is the 20th anniversary uh, of the US-UK 
uh, invasion and occupation of Iraq, which has cost a million people their lives, has sent ISIS and Al-Qaeda uh, physically and also their mindset cascading around the world, fanaticizing, extremizing people leading to terrorist eruptions around the world. The war in Iraq is not over yet. Uh, uh, and uh, I saw David Frum, the former uh, choir boy of the George W. Bush administration, concede that it was a blunder. Uh, of course, it was worse than a blunder. It was a crime, uh, to paraphrase Talleyrand. Uh, but is that common now? Are we finding a mea culpa amongst the uh, former chorus of George W. Bush that it was a blunder? Uh, there are a lot of people who are insane enough and callous enough to call it just a mere blunder, that maybe this was the American empire acting in good faith uh, and you know not with any ill intention, not with any uh, malice in its heart. And you know, uh, I can't remember which commentator it was, but someone, uh, it might have been Froome, he called it a mild success uh, in terms of strengthening Iraqi democracy. Uh, of course, what's left out of the conversation is that even conservative estimates of the death toll in Iraq crosses the half a million mark. Uh, and you're still seeing uh, uh, people being born with birth defects due to the munitions that America used uh, during the brutal war. And so for people to uh, whitewash the disgusting history that was the Iraq war, that was the global war on terror, which, you know, ended up creating far more terror than, uh, than, it, than it stopped. Uh, for people to just whitewash that, I mean, that tells you a lot about the state of American political thought. The idea that someone like George W. Bush and the criminals in his administration would be able to be uh, sanitized is insane. I mean, uh, you know, now he's just an old man who paints. Uh, and people will uh, laugh, and when he'll when he'll make gaffes about how there was a brutal and unjustified invasion of Iraq, I mean Ukraine. I mean that that's just it, it, there's a slapstick element to all of this. Is that the empire has a short memory, and the the stenographers in the media they tend to perpetuate this. Now, to be fair, there are a lot of serious mea culpas. There are a lot of people who do understand that this was a horrible, malicious event based on lies, uh, but even then, it's a mild critique because they'll say that this was a, an, aber an aberration. It was a, a one-off. It was based on the idiosyncrasies of the Bush administration and the people running it, rather than an inherent part of how American capitalism and how the American military industrial complex and how the oil majors operate all around the globe. That history is obscured because if they were really to confront that, They'd have to look in the mirror today. They'd have to see the control of uh, the, the the control that oil majors and oil interests and military interests have over the direction of U.S. foreign policy. They'd have to look at the actual individuals who were involved in it. And if they were to be serious, they would be calling all the time the fact that Victoria Newland was one of the main people uh, generating support for the Iraq War as an advisor to Dick Cheney. Well, where is she now? Well, now she is directing Eastern European policy under the Biden administration. And she has a lot to do with the problems that we see in Ukraine today. So it's the same people who are there making the same mistakes, driving the insane policy that we're still dealing with. But there doesn't seem to be any sort of real reckoning about any of that. Well, it's the Biden administration that is uh, about to call the latest U.S. warship the, uh, the Fallujah. Fallujah being the place, above all others, where children are born every single day, some of them with their brains outside of their head, with their vital organs outside of their body, deformed because of the great war crimes that the United States committed against the people of Fallujah. So, hey, let's celebrate. Let's break a bottle of champagne across the bows of the new warship, the SS Fallujah, under the Democrats 
under Lloyd Austin, under Joe Biden. Well, it's important to remember who Lloyd Austin is. Uh, Lloyd Austin, he is first and foremost a Raytheon executive. Um, that the idea that the civilian administration of the military is separate from the uh, the people in uniform is is completely bunk when you have the revolving door as clear and obvious as it is there. Uh, but to this question of naming the ship, I mean, that just shows you how craven these people are. And the American military has a long history of appropriating the names of its victims into its own structure. I mean, we have, uh, remember, Apache helicopters. Uh, well, what were the, who were the Apaches? They were a group of indigenous people that were wiped out in part by American military forces. Then you have the, the Tomahawk missile. I mean, I mean the, the list goes on. It's, it's just a, a, a clear demonstration about just how brutal of the American empire is and how little it cares about the people it trods on, uh, from Iraq to the native uh, population of America to the Vietnamese, to pick a country, pick any almost any country in the world. There is a direct line between U.S. imperialism and uh, the problems that it's facing today. Now, speaking of ships, uh, we now discover, this was, I think, the first time we met uh, when we talked about the Nord Stream, uh, we now discover uh, that Seymour Hersh was way off beam. Uh, it was a guy on a yacht what done it. It was a guy on a yacht that dived 200 feet uh, into the sea. It was a guy off a yacht that had the, uh, the devastating uh, wherewithal to penetrate the concrete casing, to know exactly where to blow and create the world's greatest methane leak and destroy 20 billion euros worth of Germany's vital infrastructure. Who knew, Bryce? <laughs> well, this has been a, a very interesting whodunit. Uh, well, let's just run back through what happened. In September of last year, the Nord Stream pipeline was uh, found to be damaged and leaking a lot of gas, and it was quickly established that this was a deliberate act. And you look at the Western press, and what was their what was the first thing that they said? They said that it was obviously Russia, that only Russia would have the means and motivations to do this, uh, and that European officials are almost all universally pointing at Russia. Well, uh, then you look at the reality, you wind back the clock a year, you wind back the clock even a few months, there's only one party in the world who has been as vociferously, oppo vociferously opposed to the pipeline's existence. There's only one party who has threatened to ensure that the pipeline does not get completed, uh, and that's the United States. Uh, and so the Western press completely ignored the fact that the United States had the largest and loudest and most publicly stated motive to destroy the pipelines. Uh, but that's where the media went, and they didn't really go anywhere else. And for a few months, there was silence. There were brief reports uh, emanating from uh, various different sources uh, about a connection between Liz Truss and a text that she may or may not have sent to Anthony Blinken. Now, these were rumors. They were unconfirmed, but they po pose a, a lot of speculation that the UK might have been the operative uh, factor in them. But then time went on and we still heard more silence. Uh, and uh, but there were reports that the German government and members of parliament were getting a little restless at the fact that they were generally excluded from the Swedish investigation and that the Swedes were keeping their, their investigation pretty close to the chest. Uh, and so the Germans, it was even reported that they were open to ideas that the United States was behind the attack or that members of the West were behind the attack. And then not a week or two after that, you have Seymour Hirsch, who is a very decorated journalist, uh, drop a, a very long and detailed story about his version about how the pipeline was destroyed. Um, and now this was quickly challenged by a lot of people in open source intelligence. Uh, they claimed that some of the planes and some of the uh, material that Hirsch alleges were being used were not actually there. Uh, and Hirsch responded to this by saying that, of course, 
anyone who would carry out this operation would be sure to cover their tracks that the open source intelligence people wouldn't be able to pin it down. And so you have that debate raging, uh, but you still have the mainstream media almost completely ignoring it. The New York Times, Hirsch's former uh, employer, refused to publish anything about this until there was this story about the Ukrainian yacht. There was a story that, uh, that German investigators had in fact found that a yacht with uh, explosive material residue discovered on it uh, was chartered by six individuals and their patron was a wealthy Ukrainian individual. Uh, But the the story was thinly sourced. It was U.S. officials, anonymous U.S. officials, citing, quote unquote, tentative intelligence uh, that this was the case. Uh, We received further confirmations. I I put that in scare quotes. because we, it's difficult to figure out what's fact and fiction, but we saw more reports in this vein from different sources from around the globe, mostly in the German press, uh, who reported in more detail, uh, citing, again, German investigators. Uh, but uh, lately, there was a, an even newer story that has nothing to do with this old one that was being that's currently being pushed by outlets like Radio Free Europe that... Uh, according to the Finnish press, that there was a Danish or a a Greek tanker that was seen in the vicinity of the pipeline blast and uh, in the the temporal uh, space that might be might be related to the attacks. Uh, And so you have to sit back and ask, what are all these stories about? What are what's going on here? Some of these stories are mutually exclusive, such as Seymour Hersh's and the, that of the New York Times. Maybe there may be overlap. There's still confusion. I don't hear people talking about this, about this alleged text between Liz Truss and uh, Anthony Blinken. Uh, but there's, there are a lot of rumors swirling around. And uh, as someone who studies the media, one thing that I'm noticing that is getting completely lost in this is the question of who benefits and why would anyone blow up these pipelines? Uh, You still have uh, the New York Times, who's obfuscating the U.S. uh, motive in all of this. In their piece, they said proudly that Ukraine was one of the chief suspects because they had uh, uh, the most to gain from the Nord Stream pipeline being exploded. Uh, Of course, they ignore that the U.S. has suddenly uh, increased its exports of liquid national gas to Germany exponentially. Uh, During the war, uh, uh, Europe became the top recipient of U.S. natural gas. And the Nord Stream pipeline, uh, if it it was to ever go back online, and if the Nord Stream 2 was to be completed and official, well, that would definitely threaten these these windfall profits from U.S. natural gas companies. But that's been completely left out of discussion. And in fact, the same can be said about Norway, who was, according to Seymour Hersh's account of the explosion, was a critical ally in the carrying out of these pipelines. Well, Norwegian exports to Germany have have skyrocketed throughout the war, and destroying the Nord Stream pipeline would help to cement these gains. So there's been a, a long, uh, a, a long campaign to sort of muddy the waters and trying to uh, obscure the the larger geopolitical uh, stakes involved in this pipeline. Now, Bryce, we set out to target the Russian banks, and now our banks are collapsing. What's the latest on the dominoes tumbling across the U.S. banking sector? Can you give us, in in, in a thumbnail sketch, how it's looking? Uh, well, this is uh, far from my area of expertise, but I can say this. Well, it appears that the U.S. government has once again stepped in to bail out some of the most wealthy uh, wealthy individuals in the United States. Uh, for those of you who don't know about this story, a bank called Silicon Valley Bank recently experienced a bank run in which depositors tried to take out a bunch of money, but the bank was unable to fulfill these deposits. Uh, Well, the U.S. government, Uncle Sam, stepped in and announced that they're going to insure these depositors even over 
the federal guarantee of $250,000 per depositor. That's the uh, FDIC guarantee. Uh, and so what this does is it essentially says to the American people that, well, we can't really bail you out if you're in trouble. Uh, same with the, you know, the housing prices and same with, well, most of the, uh, the history of neoliberalized America. We can't bail you out. But who we can bail out are the bankers. And who we can bail out are the wealthy depositors who, you know, uh, may or may not have made irresponsible decisions with their money. And so what this is, is an implicit subsidy to this sector of the economy that says that you can do whatever you want. Uncle Sam will step in and uh, and uh, make sure that you're whole, make sure that your profits aren't interrupted. And, and this has been a longstanding problem uh, in 2000. 14, I believe, the IMF came out with a study that really found that most, if not all, of American banking profits come from this uh, implicit subsidy, this implicit guarantee that they will be bailed out, this guarantee that if a yeah. bank is, quote unquote, too big to fail, well, they can't be, uh, uh, they'll be rescued. No one's going to let them fall. Uh, and that's what seems to be being reinforced here, is that the the U.S. government is absolutely with bankers. Yeah, no safety net for health, but a hell of a safety net for wealth. Bryce Green, as always, a real pleasure to talk with you this evening on the mother of all talk shows. Thanks for uh, coming on. Uh, it's actually now your show. It'll be calls right up to the hour. Let me take a quick break. Rumble had a six-figure audience within two hours of coming off the air. Something is happening here. What it is ain't exactly clear, but I'm willing to hazard a guess that the sheer weight of public curiosity for the alternative point of view, plus the fact that we produce a good show Nobody, even our worst enemies, could dispute that. We present the alternative point of view with zingers. And people need zingers. They need to instantly grasp and understand the arguments and counter-arguments that are being made. There'd be no point in me coming here and reading out a treatise, monotone, uh, filled with, uh, with footnotes. That would be uh, worse than useless. But we have managed to create a popular show that deals with complicated issues, issues that are entirely misrepresented in the so-called legacy media. And that's why I think both Moats America and Moats Berlin are going to be terrific successes. Because in both of these countries, there is a gross shortage. Not necessarily of the one. The alternative point of view exists, of course, in Germany. It exists, of course, in the United States. But it is not being delivered in a popular enough style, in a professional and popular enough style. And that's where we at most with all our experience come in. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now, Goose Creek in the Netherlands, one of our best supporters, uh, makes this point. China is being heavily criticized by the West about their solar panel farms ruining mountain tops. Although what's that it's got to do with the West, I'm not sure. Apparently, China has enough solar power to energize every home in China. What's wrong with that? Asks Goose. Okay, some mountains are covered in panels, but thousands of others aren't. In Scotland, he says, where I'm from, they are cutting down. 14 million trees to make way for wind turbines. In my opinion, 
not very green. Anyway, I support you and love you almost as much as I love Celtic, says Goose. Hell, hell. And Mike C says the US farm lobby need other countries dependent on American farmers. So the US controlled IMF requires the farmers in the Netherlands to close down. Well, they got their answer at the ballot box today. It just goes to show that small parties can become big and big parties can become small. Studio 7 says the Dutch stood against the Nazis in World War II. We must support them today. Well, up to a point, Studio 7. Don't, uh, don't tempt me. Uh, Rob is in Toronto. Let's hear from him. Rob, welcome. Evening, George. Thanks for taking my call. I'd like to ask you a fairly broad, big picture question, so I apologize in advance. <laughs> Go ahead. We've got one NATO led misadventure in Ukraine that I think you'll agree is an unmitigated disaster for the West, and we've got little hope of success. No. Um, the latest coalition of the willing, I'll call it coalition of the willing 2.0 against China. Uh, that's not really showing any signs of being successful. That now internally, our banking systems are failing, our industry's drying up, infrastructure's crumbling, so on and so forth. I could go on. My question to you is, how do you see this playing out in the next year or two? Um, to be honest, I can see the West imploding in some way. Uh, the problem is I see no leadership in the West capable of tackling anything serious, quite frankly. And even voting seems to be irrelevant because they're all the same party. It uh, feels kind of hopeless sometimes, you know? No, I, I don't think it's hopeless, uh, Rob, at all. It's true that in your country and mine, uh, there is no, if you like, popular or populist uh, leader capable of providing uh, none of the above option for people. Uh, our electoral system, certainly in Britain, uh, locks out uh, any possibility of such a leader emerging. If it didn't, I'd be that leader, uh, he said modestly. But we don't have that, and so I'm not that leader. And uh, uh, I don't think anyone else is going to fill that gap. But in other countries, there are. In France, there is. Mr. Mélenchon is my option on that. Other options are available. In the Netherlands, there are multiple uh, none-of-the-above candidates uh, capable of contesting for power. In Germany, there are two, uh, one on the left and one on the right. Uh, in the United States, uh, Donald Trump undoubtedly uh, rightly or wrongly, is seen as that none of the above uh, option, the maverick option to kick over the tables outside the temple and so on. Even though he made such grotesque errors of judgment and hiring and actions uh, and instead of draining the swamp, promoted the swamp, even despite all of that, the fact that he was hamstrung, the fact that he was sabotaged by the worst people in America, the pussy hat, Clinton, liberal commentariat and chatterati, has so incensed tens of millions of American people that he stands a fighting chance, I'd say, uh, of making a comeback in 2024 if he stays one step ahead of the, the, the devil and the excise man, as the great Scottish poet Robert Burns uh, put it. So I'm not pessimistic, uh, Rob. And the success of this show, particularly last week, 1.24 million views in a week in a show with a budget so small you'd laugh at it if I told you it. Uh, is uh, a sign of things to come. I am, on the contrary, optimistic. 
uh, 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 thanks for the call and a big up to all my friends in Canada. Mick is in Notting Hill in London. Wants to talk about NATO. Mick, welcome. Hello, George. Can you hear me? All right, Mick, go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, listen, uh, <coughs> nice to speak to you again. Uh, and you, sir? Yeah. Mate, just, just a simple question, really. Uh, you know, um, th th there's loads of protests all over Europe. Czech Republic, Germany, Berlin, obviously same place. But <clears throat> I know you've got no, and, they, and, and that, that, that seemed fantastic. I, I, I didn't go, I must admit. But what I'm saying is, when are we going to protest on the streets and, and who's going to organise it? Because I really need to get out in front of Parliament and, and, and shit all over their building and tell them I don't want their war. Good. Please. Well, uh, um, very colourfully uh, put. Uh, thanks uh, for that, Mick. Um, the, uh, the British are, of course, uh, very slow to anger. We're not the French. Uh, and we're not the Germans, we're not the Slovaks and the Hungarians uh, who have poured onto the streets of their uh, capitals and indeed provincial cities uh, to reject NATO, to reject the neoliberal policies of the NATO leaders. Uh, we're not like that. Um, the British are slow, supine, you may say. Uh, but there are uh, some signs. There are many more people on strike today, budget day, uh, than have been on strike on budget day possibly ever. The railway workers are still fighting. The junior doctors are still fighting. The nurses, the teachers are still fighting. The university staffs are still fighting for a pay increase that doesn't savagely reduce their standard of living. Uh, misplaced uh, votes are going to parties outside the mainstream, particularly the now pro-NATO Green Party, who just abandoned their uh, decades-long opposition to NATO. They are now part of the NATO gang, but Voters don't know that. They see the Greens as some kind of alternative, and they are winning uh, by-elections. Uh, people are not voting Conservative or uh, Starmer, Blair, uh, Labour. Uh, so these are incohate signs as to who's going to organise it. Well, it won't be me. Uh, I won't be uh, here. I'm not able to properly function here. Uh, my life is threatened here. The police do nothing about it here. Uh, I've got to uh, go somewhere where I can uh, work uh, freely and not uh, live in fear of my life. Uh, but others uh, will emerge, I'm uh, perfectly sure. Um, the only thing I'd say, Mick, you might not like this, whatever happened to Nigel Farage? He could have been, actually, the kind of right-wing populist leader that Donald Trump turned out to be in the United States. Why did he give it up? Why did he throw in the towel? Uh, that's one of the great mysteries of the age. I've no idea why Farage effectively gave up politics to be, I don't know, an advertiser, a face in, in financial services advertising. Very puzzling to me. Any suggestions as to why on a postcard will be greatly received, as are the suggested uh, names for the new U.S. warships still flooding in, if you'll forgive the pun. Uh, uh, Subliminal Art says the USS Bullshine. Very good. The USS Gaddafi. Uh, John Smith says the USS Aboriginal. Very good. Tim S. says the USS Biden-Laden, the USS 
Klaus Schwab and Dante Alighieri says the USS Pol Pot. You see, Dante, I'm so old I remember when the United States was demanding that Pol Pot continue to occupy Cambodia's seat at the United Nations, as was Margaret Thatcher. Just think about that. And Roger Asai says the USS Veni Vedi Mortuus Est. We came, we conquered, he died. On the line from the Bronx is Gino. Let's hear from him again. Gino, welcome. We, I love the little Bronx <laughs> vignette we had on Sunday night. Three callers about the Bronx. I almost <laughs> felt I was walking uh, amongst the amongst the projects in the Bronx. Go ahead. Oh, George, uh, blessings upon your cranium. It's, yes, it's the metamorphosis, man, or me the more for this, the intimations of immortality experiences. <laughs> George, you, you, I like what you said. I, I love a lot of things you're saying. You know, your, your daily communion it, it, with God is to your conscience. I, I wanted to comment on that. That's beautifully said. Yeah. And also, Thank you. I think that uh, Armageddon, what you said about it doesn't have to happen, that... Uh, they want to get the arms there. They want to get the oil. I'm a get it. And that's the way they see it. I'm a get it. But uh, honestly, with free will, it doesn't have to happen as fatalistic thinkers in, in biblical language uh, tend to think. I don't believe that either. They forget the prophet who predicted the end of a city and people repented and it didn't happen. Now, George, Gigi, uh, you know, that fellow called up, but I don't know if I was a gentleman who referred to that we have no trees in the Bronx, although the other fellow called up and said we do. In fact, uh, what was his name? Richard I, and it was Richard II there. Uh, he, he said there was no trees. Well, uh, Richard, if you're listening, we have over 5,000 acres of trees in Parkland, and uh, Manhattan, uh, Central Park is 6% of Manhattan's 843 acres. So come on up. You're missing out. Uh, and thank you, Elder Richard. I'm, I'm on my it. way. I'm on my way, Gino. It <laughs> sounds wonderful. You're... And the zoo, you said... apparently you've got a zoo in the Bronx. It's five, it's five minute walk for me, and that's where we saved the buffaloes in the United States, which I'm sure the Indians are thankful for, Native Americans. Uh, the Bronx used to be the Suinoi <laughs> tribe before the, the uh, Swedish man, which the Bronx is named after, Johannes Bronx. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, I live right next to the Botanical Garden. If you come up, George, with your family, and I saw your lovely wife today in a picture, <laughs> you are welcome, and your kids and all. I will give you a grand tour. Uh, 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 your, your assistant there, uh, Jaya, got my number, and I even offered her if she comes up with friends. I'll give you a grand tour of the place. Now, as far as uh, who we got for hoping, I saw an interview with Jimmy Dore, which I recommend everybody listen to. Uh, recently with Robert Kennedy Jr. It's excellent. He wants to run for president. I think he must have heard us the last time we talked. Tulsi, where are you? Get on there. And uh, and I just want you to know, George, uh, because he said he could become like the, the Donald Trump of the Democratic Party. They don't want him. The business people don't want him because he's an honest man protecting children's health helped with the vaccination issues that he, pre he sued a lot of people all these decades. He used to clean up the Hudson River. And he's going to run, I believe. So, and my prayers, George, I got you on my prayer list. I only known you recently, but I know where you're coming from. And all the people out there listening, please say your prayers for this man, because anybody who's a channel for the truth is a threat to these dark, envious, psychopathic, greedy, well, you named the seven deadly sins. But there are seven virtues, and George, you manifest quite a few of them that I can see. And uh, I think you do all well of them, but what degree or other, that's between you and the Creator. But I thank you, your breath of fresh air. I, I, I really enjoy what you're doing, and I will get in touch. Oh, one last thing. Sid and Nancy, I, I, I played back what we were talking about because I couldn't hear myself or see what was said. Uh, Sid and Nancy Kirkpatrick's book on Edgar Casey. it's called An American Prophet, and you're going to China. Do you know what he said about Russia and China, this seer that America produced? He said, out of Russia will come, will come the hope of the world, not communism, but living for a fellow man. And also, he said, in the future, it, it seems a long time to us, but China is going to become the cradle of Christianity. 
And Russia will inspire them, I'm sure, because they are Christianizing and they're turning back to the, to, the, to the one who put us all here. Now, I don't belong to any particular group, George. Even when I talk about Casey, even Virginia Beach, like the church, they don't follow everything that they got under their nose. So, but he is the closest person I've come to in America since I'm 18 that inspired me, continues to inspire me, gave his life. He's not supposed to do more than two or three readings a day. He, he had a book about his life come out three years before he died. He started doing 11, 12, 13 readings. He was told not to do that many. He literally gave his life. He had a stroke to help answer questions to save people's lives. So please read the book. If you come up, I'll tell you a story beyond the butterfly story. And that'll be in the Botanical Gardens. And you, your wife, the kids, I'd be, it'll be a joy to take these around. I'll treat you to raviolis. God bless you. You can see our three cats. And I'm very close to the gardens. So if you ever come up this way, I'd be happy God to be you, escort Gina. you around. Or you, God bless you. That's the, that's the best offer that we've had. And my good wife is giving me the thumbs up on that offer right now. God bless you and yours. That was Gino in the Bronx on Robert Kennedy Jr., amongst other things, including the hundreds of acres of trees in the Bronx. Who knew? Is President Donald Trump the only man who can halt the slide to World War III on Twitter? Yes, 65%. No, 35%. On YouTube, yes, 53%. No, 47%. On Telegram, yes, 56%. No, 44% and on the community poll, yes, 57, no, 43. That is uh, remarkably close compared to many other polls. But Donald, you won and 17,591 people voted. Uh, Bill Galley sends 10 US dollars. Thank you, Bill. D Smith, one pound. Thanks, D. Jenny B, one pound. Thank you, Jenny. Nasri Akil, 10 Canadian dollars. Subhanallah, GG. Thank you, Nasri. Desmond McCabe, two pounds. Thank you, Desmond. Neko, three US dollars. Uh, thanks, Michael Angel Osobiaga, 109 Canadian dollars. Hami Rami, two pounds. Hi, GG. Here's your coffee money. Thanks, Hami. Mark Freeman gives three Australian dollars. John Fitzy, two pounds. Michael Horstman, four dollars ninety-nine US. That is uh, very generous of so many of you. Now, uh, my Patreon, of course, is particularly important to me. If me and my wife and kids are going to get to the Bronx, it'll only be thanks to Patreon. Uh, James Lenehan says, as of now, Trump is the only candidate that can uh, stop World War III. De Sanctimonious says he can do it, but I don't believe him. Neither do I, James. Uh, David Nimmo says DeSantis won't do it. He is a military-industrial complex insider. Trump talks a better game this time, though goodness knows presentation isn't one of his skills. He did try to make Colonel Douglas McGregor, ambassador to Germany. Lastly, who else is there? Well, there's Jimmy Dore, and we now know there's Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Uh, Paul Vinogradov says an impossible question. Even if you believe Trump is more sane than any of the machine politicos, he has poor judgment in those he chooses to surround him. And when he was president, they included even John Bonkers Bolton and others of the same kidney who probably think World War III should have been kicked off in 1945 as soon as Berlin had fallen to the Red Army. There has probably never been more reason to fear the imminent destruction of all life than today. I agree with that, Paul. I can't see Donald Trump in the role of global saviour, but I do think Robert Kennedy Jr., has a Rooseveltian stamp, and that is the only glimmer of hope I discern. Thank you, Paul. And Monica Rangne says, Trump talks a good game, but I haven't forgotten what he said and did last time. He's a diagnosed malignant narcissist. His niece and the 1,000 clinicians who took out that full-page duty to warn ad in the New York Times. 
He'll say whatever needed to get elected, as others do. People forget about Soleimani, the bombs, his stupid remarks about why aren't we using our nukes, his six bankruptcies, two were casinos. Takes genius to lose money in a casino. Uh, his judgment is bad and surrounds himself with criminals. As for DeSantis, he's a sadistic sociopath who really enjoyed torturing the inmates at Guantanamo, pretending to be a human rights lawyer so he could find out their biggest fears and then subject them to just that, whilst grinning sadistically in the background. Oy vey, says Monica, we are so screwed. Let's hear from Greece, where Demetrius wants to talk about democracy. Well, they invented it. Go ahead, Demetrius. Hi, George. Nice to talk to you. I'm watching you for a long time. And you, I admire your show you're doing. Say God, we got people like you saying the truth around. I want to ask you a question, George. What the European leaders and uh, everybody, Americans and everybody talking about democracy? Because I don't see no democracy nowhere. And the support... Turn your volume down, Demetrius. Okay. You're hearing yourself. I don't know yeah, what go those ahead. people thinking about, they're talking about democracy. Democracy comes from Greece, but even Greece now does not have democracy. Everywhere it's, uh, the world goes upside down, they're talking about democracy. No, I don't see nobody from the leaders from the EU and um, everywhere else to talk about the Americans. They occupy one third from Greece or uh, from Syria and they steal the oil there. And nobody talking about that. The well, look, I'll tell you what, uh, uh, I'll tell you what, uh, they say, Demetrius, beware of the Greeks bearing gifts, a reference to the Trojan horse. I say beware of the Democrats bearing democracy. And I'll be giving a speech at a conference in Beijing next week on what is democracy. If democracy is government of the people, by the people, for the people, where have we got any democracy in our 13% of the global population that we laughingly call the West, which includes, of course, places that aren't in the West and counts many, many people in Western countries that have absolutely no time for the ruling class, the ruling elite that exploit us in the name of so-called democracy. Is America ruled by the people, for the people? Is it really? No one could claim that. No one could claim that Britain is governed by the people, for the people. No one could claim that. And yet, and yet they do. They call other people undemocratic, even though the outcomes of the political systems they employ are almost infinitely more democratic than the outcome of the system that we call democracy here in Western countries. And that's the theme that I'll be talking about in Beijing. I'll be looking at what democracy really means, what democracy really is, and who really are the Democrats. And I say, beware of these Democrats bearing democracy because it has brought us endless war, endless division, endless exploitation, degradation, depravity. It has brought us to the brink of Sodom and Gomorrah in Western countries. We'll be being turned into Pillars of salt next. There is no sin, no vice that isn't triumphant in Western countries today while our living standard goes through the floor. You know, I grew up in an age when my parents fully expected uh, that me and my sister and brother would 
have a better life and a longer life than them. And we grew up thinking that our children would have a better life, a longer life than us. But that's not true. Our children and their children do not have now a longer life, a better life than us. We had a better life than them. And so, the system we have that we call democracy is running out of steam. It has begun to break down. It is systematically flawed. It is a victim of its own contradictions, as we discussed with the peerless master, Professor Richard Wolff, last Wednesday. If you didn't watch my interview with Professor Richard Wolff, you really have missed something. You'll get it now, right now, on YouTube. 100,000 people have watched it on YouTube alone. A masterful discourse in just 12 or 13 minutes of the state we are in. And this was all predicted, you know, by a very great German, Dr. Marx, who predicted in 1848, when he was in his 20s, that the system we have, by the time it reached its late stage, everything that is solid will have melted into air, and everything that is sacred will be profaned. How's that for a prediction? Is there anything sacred left that has not been profaned? Is there anything solid that we had that has not melted into air? Is there? Ask yourself, all the things that we thought were permanent features of our lives are no longer. And the trust that we had in institutions that we thought would sustain us into the future are no more. Thank you, Demetrius, for giving me the chance to talk about that and look out for my speech at the Forum on Democracy in Beijing, where I will be telling some home truths on what democracy is and isn't. So many USS carrier suggestions still coming in. I like this one, perhaps best of all, from Nicholas Byrne, the USS Fallen Empire. Uh, Reynold Liao says the USS Snowden. And Chris Lothian says the USS Darth Biden. And off rail, Russia Gators says the USS Toria Blot Boat. USS Bankster Sinking. USS Killery Clunkton. And Centaurus says perhaps the best one of all. USS Moats. I'm touched by that, Centaurus. I hope very soon to have important announcements to make about Moats Berlin and Moats America and who knows, maybe Moats China. How about that then? Because this has been a success story and it's partly down to me. I'm quite good at this. It's partly down to my able team who are very, very good at what they do. It's partly down to my good wife, Gayatri, without whom none of this would be happening. But it's partly down to you. You are the people who have stuck with this show and transformed it into a truly global university, where it can be said that every month, at least four million people will watch this show in the month of March. Imagine. And you've heard tonight, they're in Greece, they're in Canada, they're in America, they're in England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, they're in New Zealand, they're in Australia, they're in Norway, Denmark, Sweden, they're in Finland. They're all over the world. They're in Africa with a call from Nigeria on Wednesday. This is a truly 
global phenomenon, and that is down to you. So I'm asking you to join me again on Sunday at the earlier time of 7 p.m. Now the U.S. clocks have changed, so take care you don't miss the beginning of the mother of all talk shows on Sunday at 7 p.m. UK time. And I want to ask you to please bring one more viewer with you. Make a promise to me now that you will try and recruit one new viewer for Sunday's mother of all talk shows when we'll be looking, amongst other things, at the 20th anniversary of the invasion, slaughter and occupation of Iraq. Unless there's another disaster before that. Good night.